You know, last week, Pastor Dwayne, man, he preached a powerful message. If you missed it, you missed a good one. Um, but if you want to catch it, once again, you can go online. We upload it online. If you go on our line, you hit the sermon button, hit sermons, and all our sermons that we preached are in there now, and you're able to watch it. So if one day you have something to do, and you're like, oh, man, I don't want to miss church, but you can, there you go. It's only if you miss church, not to miss church on purpose, knowing that it's there. There's a big difference if you can come to church. Um, but it's there for you. But I encourage you to go see it because was, it was awesome. He preached it. He spoke on obedience and trust. And he said, those two go hand in hand. You truly can't trust the Father. You truly can't trust God if you're not obeying God. And you, are, and you truly can't obey God if you're not trusting God. They go hand in hand. You have to do both. Amen. You can't choose to say, okay, I'll choose to f believe this, believe that, and then put it all together and figure, and that's your life and that's your testimony. You have to truly trust and obey God. And that's the message that we've been speaking on for this past several weeks in this series that we call a true relationship, unity in the body of Christ. And we took this message out of the book of John chapter 17, where we, you know, we spoke about Jesus speaking three uh, preaching three specific prayers, right? First, he prayed for himself. Then he prayed for his disciples. And then he prayed for you and for me, which is one of the most amazing things that just right before he was about to be betrayed, that he was, when he was about to be crucified, he was thinking of you and me. He was thinking of, okay, I have done my call here on earth. I have followed my God's plan. I obeyed it knowing that I was going to die on a cross, a criminal's death for something that I didn't do. And, not, and I'm doing it for my loved ones. I'm doing it for the people that will get to hear my message. One, these, once these 11 or 12 then, right there before Jesus, uh, Judas betrayed him are going to go into the world and share my gospel. Amen. He was thinking of you and me. What better definition of relationship? What better definition of family and unity in the body of Christ? Amen. So that's what we're speaking about today. So the first week we, told, we spoke on humbling ourselves. We have to come before the Lord with a humble spirit. And then we have to obey him, trust him. And now, today, we put it all together, and we're doing what God has called us to do, what Jesus came to this world to do, and that's to take care of his flock. Amen? To take care of our church family, to take care of the people that God has placed in our lives. That's what we are called to do. So we're going to bring it all together. And that's why it's so important to make sure that we get in the word, that we try to do things together to reach this perfect relationship, just like Father God and, 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 and Jesus Christ, the Son, had. And we'll see that later on in Scripture. But how do we begin this relationship? And that's like I spoke to you about caring for his flock. If we recall, and this is not in the outline, so don't click. <laughs> um, I'm helping you out. Um, in John chapter 17, Jesus, when he was praying by, for himself, he's telling God, God, I have done everything on earth that you have told me to do. Now I am leaving this world. They are staying behind. Protect them by the power of your name so they could be united. That's the key word. So they could be united, so they could have a relationship, so they could be a family, so they could be one. Then he goes, just as you and me are one. So he's praying to the Lord, to Father God. He's saying, Lord, protect them. Because now I am leaving. I have protected them here when I walked with them for the, you know, for the few years that I was here on earth. I protected them. I did what you told me to do. But now that I am leaving, protect them by the power of your name. So that's why it was so important that the Holy Spirit would come and would live inside of them. So they could be guided and directed the way they were supposed to go. That they knew that they were supposed to stay together. Because there's unity in numbers. Amen. So he's, so he's praying this message. And he's telling them they need to be united just as you and me are. That is so powerful. And then Jesus turns around and he's telling you and he's telling me. You protect the people that God has placed in your family. That God has placed in your path. You protect the people that you're starting to gather around with. Those friendships that you're making. It's your responsibility. In that responsibility, it's huge. There's a huge responsibility. You know, when Pastor Dwayne and myself said to, you know, said yes to Pastor Pete as far as, you know, 
being the, the pastors here in this church, we just didn't say, yeah, I'll go do that because I want to be a pastor. <laughs> you know, that was in my heart. That was my calling. But it was, no, I will gladly do it. I will gladly serve the Lord. But I also know that there's a responsibility that when we get up here, whoever gets up here, that they're preaching the word of God, amen, that they're preaching the truth from cover to cover. It's not just me saying anything that I think feels good or right. You know, sometimes some things in here are not as popular as they should be nowadays. But we need to preach it all, amen, cover to cover. And, and we need to preach it with love. Love, love starts the relationship process. It's all with love because when you say you love someone, that means that you're putting your prideful self aside. You're, the things that you want to get out of the relationship, and you're saying, no, your, your, your personality, your relationship, your bond, it's more important to me. That's what Jesus did, right? He did it by example, and we're supposed to follow just that. Amen? Look at what First Peter says in chapter 5. It says, and here it is, care for the flock that God has entrusted you with. Watch over them willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you will get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Let me repeat that one again. Because you are eager to serve God. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. That's a powerful, powerful message. See, at this point in time, Peter was speaking to the Jewish Christians as they were being persecuted. They were being killed for their faith. And he's telling them at this point in, their, in time, he goes, you need to worry about the flock that God has given you. Yes, there's persecutions going around. Yes, people are killing for, being killed for their, by the, for their faith, for proclaiming the name of Jesus. And, and yes, you take care of yourself, but you still need to take care of the people that God has placed in your life. Don't say, oh, no, it's, too, it's getting too dangerous. I'm going to run the other way now. They were being persecuted. They were being scattered. The news, the message needed to go across the world. That was part of God's plan. You know, they can't get too comfortable in one place and say, man, I'm just opening the doors and hopefully people come in. No, we're supposed to go out. Sometimes it's going to be tough. Sometimes you're going to get a door shut on you. Sometimes someone's going to ridicule you or make fun of you. But you know what? We're still called to do what God has told us to do, and that's take care of the family of Christ. Amen? That's to take care of our church family. Amen? This is our, this is our family. And then you also have another family in your home. And then your friends, your re relationships, whatever it is, it's all one family. And we're all supposed to help each other out, strengthen each other out, encourage each other out. Amen? Put others before ourselves. Because that's what Jesus Christ has told us to do. And that's what Peter is telling here. He's telling the church, lead by example. And then God, because he's God and he loves us, he goes, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the fruit of the Spirit. Now, remember, it's a singular word. It's fruit. It's not a plural. It's not fruit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And there's nine characteristics in this fruit. You have love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness. Ooh, what else? Self-control. I'm missing two more. And um, who can give me this? Uh, keep saying them yourself. I think I said them. I just didn't count right, right? I just don't know how to count. Um, but... God is saying to you, I'm giving you the fruit of the Spirit to help you, to guide you. So whenever, <laughs> whenever someone cuts you off the road <laughs> on your way to church, you go, Lord, give me a little more self-control today. Amen? If someone is being hateful to you, let me have a loving patience for this person. Let me have a loving kindness. Let me show them humility. Strengthen me today, Lord. You know, um, let me be gentle today. Let me have some peace today because my house is in, this, is in disorder. And I need to just set aside and give me some peace. Give me a peaceful spirit. So then I could pray for peace and they understand. Whatever it is, pray that the Lord will give you and strengthen that part, that characteristic in that fruit. And that's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And we all have those nine characteristics inside of us. Some are stronger than others because we don't work on the rest. But we are supposed to work and ask the Lord to continue to strengthen us and guide us and be in the right way we're supposed to go. Humble ourselves, trusting the Father with obedience, being obedient so we could establish this true relationship and the unity in the body of Christ. Amen. Look what Jeremiah 3 says. And here's what's awesome about this. We're talking about being, make sure that we're preaching the truth. It says, and I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you 
with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah was talking to the nation of Israel after they have came back from bondage. Uh, as they were taken away from bondage and they return, Jeremiah is saying, this is what God is saying now. He's going to give you shepherds. He's going to give you people in your path that will guide you, that will strengthen you, that would encourage you, that will protect you, that will lead you in the right way. He's telling him, so don't, so just make sure you stay connected to the Father. Don't turn and go the other way again. This is the way it will be. And because God is saying, I will give you. Not, it's not going to be by any human effort or by any presumed calling. It's saying, no, God's saying, no, I am going to choose the people that I'm going to put in your path to direct you. You were placed in this earth for a purpose, and that's to protect the people that God has entrusted you with. If it's here in the church and the leadership team, that's why it's a huge responsibility. If God has put us up, you know, to protect this church, we're supposed to do it with loving kindness, with all our heart. Just like Pastor Dwayne said last week, and it was so important, Jesus, Jesus shouldn't be saying, man, I'm in, I am in uh, competition here with something else in your life that's more important. Jesus should never have competition in our heart. He should never feel that. He has to constantly say, hey, are you going to let me in today? He should be the, you should be sold out for Christ. Sold out completely. So God is telling him, we're going to give you, so if he gave you that calling in that leadership, in that direction, you do it with gladness and eagerness, like Peter said. Eagerness because you're serving the Lord, amen. That's what he's talking about. He says, shepherds are given to the people by God for their care and their service. Shepherds should be caring for God's flock. Shepherds should be according to God's heart, not our own human heart. Not our own desires. Shepherds should be feeding God's people with knowledge. Shepherds should be feeding God's people with understanding. Shepherds should be humble and obedient. Just as Jesus was. Amen. That's what we are called to do. That's a sign of a true shepherd. Of a true per loving person that's caring. That is trying to lead people the right way. Amen. That's when you know that they're not doing it at their own selfish price. To, to see what they're going to get out of it. Because it's not about what we can get out of it. It's never that. It's all, we're always doing it because we're eager to serve the Lord. Amen. Because that's what we're told to do. That's what you are called to do. Amen. So why should we seek this true relationship? Why should we seek it? You know, <laughs> and me and my wife were driving up here this morning. And, he's, and he, she said it right. But it was what Pastor Dwayne said last week. Because God is God and he told us to. <laughs> that's the bottom line. That's the main reason. God said so. God is God, and he said that. So we follow his command. But it's a simple. But it's because God is telling us in the scriptures, in the Bible, we are supposed to seek, go out into the world, share the gospel, make followers of Jesus who will make followers of Jesus. That's what we're called to do, amen? So we're supposed to do it with gladly, gladly with joy in our hearts, amen? Pursue this true relationship that is only found in Jesus Christ, amen? That's what's important. Luke 12 says, When someone has given you much, much will be required in return. Do you see that? When someone's giving you much, much is required of you in return. And when someone has entrusted you with much, he's saying even more will be required. It's our responsibility. Jesus is telling us how to live here on earth. Until he returns, we're supposed to watch for him, work diligently, obey his commands. In other words, if you want more blessings in lives, much more will be required. Amen. Just because we receive more doesn't mean we keep it. We're supposed to be more giving and more loving. It's supposed to be filtering through us, not stopping in us. Amen. That's what it's all about. That's what friendship and relationship and family is all about. When you are blessed... You're supposed to give more back in return. And if you continue this cycle, then guess what? More blessings will come your way. The world today calls it karma. There is no such thing as karma. It's all God's blessings, amen? It's all about God blessing you because you were obedient and you were a loving, per loving and kind person. And you were doing exactly what God has told you to do. If you receive much, much is given. If you receive blessings of finances, then guess what? 
Support the people that are in need. Support the orphans and the widows. If you are giving words of encouragement, then you be the biggest cheerleader that God, that, that, that God has placed on, this, on the face of this earth. You go and encourage people. Amen. There's people like that around me that are constantly happy people. This is one of them. It doesn't matter what's going on. This man always has a smile on his face until he's serious or once in a while he messes around. But he's the biggest encourager. All you have to do is just be around him and you naturally feel happy and joyful inside. When you find those people that have been given that blessing, it's not finances. But they are more excited with what they have. And some, more often than not, those are the people that sometimes that are struggling, but are saying, man, I am so thankful where God has me. I wouldn't change it any other way, but I'm going to continue just to give you words of encouragement, words of power that will lift you up because God is good. Amen. And we're supposed to call to do that. When much is given, much is required. Not just finances like, Pastor, like Brother Rod was speaking about. It's, it has nothing to do with the number. Amen. It's all how you give it. That's what's most important. And people naturally feel that when, you, when they receive it. They feel that love that comes through. It's our responsibility as Christ followers to spread the good news. We need to make followers of Jesus who make followers of Jesus. Because God loves us. And he's encouraging us. And he gives us a rule book on how to do it. He gives us examples on how to do it. And when you're truly living by his word, then you start feeling kind of like uncomfortable, like, Lord, just like Job says, Lord. And that's my next scripture in Job chapter 7. He says, what are people? In other words, who am I? If you want to just break it down and make it personal, who am I, God? Who am I? And that's what Job is saying. What are people that you should make so much of us? That you should think of us so often. God, who am I that you're thinking of me so often? What am I here on earth? I'm just this puny little thing. And you're the God, the creator. You're the creator of the world. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You're the most powerful person in this world. Who am I that you are thinking of me often? That is powerful. For you examine us every morning and test us every moment. See, don't get too comfortable just because you made it to church today. <laughs> that doesn't mean that, you, that, that, you, that you, you're in right standing with God just because you made it to church. Or don't get too comfortable just because you didn't cuss at someone when they cut you off, like I said earlier. All that means is that you passed your test for today. But what about tomorrow? Amen. We're supposed to continue to try to do it every day and live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. And yes, we're going to make mistakes. Because none of us are perfect. I am not perfect. I am not perfect. But we say, Lord, with your loving grace and your help and your encouragement by your Holy Spirit living inside of me, today I'm not going to get as mad as I did yesterday and hopefully it will continue and continue and I don't have to worry about this problem. Now I can start working on this one. And once I get this one across, guess what? There's another one. Because the devil doesn't like you to start doing those little checks on your list if you have one. Okay, today I don't have to worry about self-control. Today I don't have to worry about patience, about being kind, about being loving. And you start crossing these out, the devil's going to be right there and saying, dude, no, wait a minute. I don't like this. You know, you have to understand. So here's Job saying, who am I? And Job had his whole family destroyed, taken away. He lost all his finances, all his power, all everything he had. He was the most wealthy person in the face of the earth when this happened. And the devil had a conversation with God. And, he's and God is telling the devil, have you noticed my servant Job? You could do whatever you want to him. You could do anything you want to him. The only thing that you are not allowed to do is kill him. But you could do anything you want. And here's Job's reaction. Who am I? Who am I? Amen. That is powerful. That is so powerful. Look it up. Philippians 3.10. This is my favorite scripture in the Bible. Um, there's many scriptures that I love. But this, is, this scripture, when I was going through some time and some difficulties, this is the first scripture that God sent me to. And this is my favorite scripture in the whole Bible. And it says, I want to know Christ. 
I. In other words, I'm putting past anyone, any relationship, any person that keeps telling me you need to go search for Jesus or you need to get right with this. It's me by myself standing in front of God and saying, I want to know Christ. I am putting myself aside, my selfish desires and saying, no, it's between me and God. There's nobody else that's going to tell me, no, I'm going to help you get there. No, I want to do this. I want to take that first step and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Amen. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. In other words, what Paul was telling the Philippian church, in order to know Christ, we have to put aside our selfish desires, our prideful freedom, our worldly friendships. And when I mean by worldly friendships, I'm not talking about everyone in the world, okay? Because we're called to reach the lost, right? I am speaking about the people that have a direct influence in you, pulling you away from the Lord. Amen? The, some of those that we call friends, okay? The ones that have more influence on you than you do on them. Those are the ones that we have to be careful with. Maybe we're not, we shouldn't be there yet. Let's work on the ones that we could influence and we could work on. Amen? That's what I mean when I'm talking about worldly friendships because you can't just say no to the whole world. You're supposed to go share it to the world. But you still pray for them. Amen. Don't just go hang out with them at two in the morning to watch a movie. After you watch a movie and go there, and then they're influencing you, then you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Amen. Can I hear? Can I get an amen on that one? Okay. <laughs> I was like, everybody got quiet. Uh, what type of sacrifices are you willing to do? Are you willing to take to have a genuine, true relationship with Jesus Christ? Because we may think it's a sacrifice, but it is really not. Amen. It's because we do it just like they were like in the scripture before, because we're eager to serve God, because we love Him, because He has transformed us, because He had changed us from the what what we used to be and what we used to do. That's why I tell people, you know what? You don't have to memorize scripture if you don't. That's great because before you go out and talk to someone else, because that's what they think. Well, I don't know scripture that well. I don't know what to say or what to do. You know what? All you have to do is just share your own personal experience. Tell them how God changed in changed you inside that is more powerful because that has me to it because you experience it it's the truth and you could tell that better than no one else can amen because that's your personal testimony that's what's so powerful do that because you're saying i want to know christ i choose to know christ and christ lives inside of me so now i need to just go and share this with the world amen let me give you eight ways on how I feel, how I think we should be, you could build a strong relationship. And, and it starts by saying, pray for me. When you want to speak with someone with the love, with the, it's your brothers, your sisters, your mom, your dad, a friend, co-worker, whoever it is, and you could tell them, pray for me. And then it says, then pray with me. And ju or just pray. That's what I mean with those three. Pray for me, pray with me, or just pray. But the most important thing we could do is pray. Amen. So that's one of the first foundations of building a relationship. Another one is go to church together. Invite that friend. You know what? Let's come to church. Let's go today. Choose the day where you're going to go. Read the Bible together. If you're struggling, read it together. That is powerful. It's a hard one, but you can do it. Love Jesus more than you love others, number four. Number five, volunteer in church. When you're working in an activity together, you get to spend time with that person. Guess what? When you, what happens when you spend time with someone? You get to know them a little bit better. You get to know a couple of their stories and their life experiences because they begin to share. Grow together spiritually. As we're coming together to church, we're fellowshipping. We're trying to learn more about what the Word of God says. We're, going, we're growing together spiritually. We're strengthening each other. Amen? trusting in God's plan for your life and for my life. So when you see someone that was blessed with something, rejoice with them. Strengthen them and encourage them. Man, isn't God good? Because in return, when something good happens to you, they're going to do the same thing. And now you start seeing the, what God is, how God is blessing you. Then you get encouraged and you start working together and, and boom, that relationship, the relationship starts to happen. And then number eight, just love each other like Jesus taught you how to love because Jesus is love amen love is not Jesus Jesus is love love is just an expression it's a feeling 
sometimes I could love pizza today more than something else. But Jesus, I will always love him the same. Amen. <laughs> but the, I know, but I do love pizza. <laughs> um, the biggest lesson that Jesus taught us about this true relationship, about building a relationship with love is, is what, he, what he said was the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your understanding, right? He says, love the Lord your God first. Then he said, what's equally as, more, as important is to what? To love your neighbor as yourself. That's a tough one sometimes when you have some tough neighbors. Amen? But that's what God has called us to do, right? Those two things. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. Amen? Can, can I get an amen on that one? Yeah. <laughs> You're, you're, tripping, you're just tripping on that one. That's why it's important, and I'm telling you, this, that's why this is going to be a little bit hard. Okay? If, you don't, if you're not really good with this neighbor, then give it to this neighbor. You got another one on the other side. But if you live in a corner church, you're in trouble. And you're in a, corner, in a corner house, and you're in trouble. You only have one neighbor to go to. Um, but it's so important. Pray together. Love each other together. Build a relationship. Strengthen each other. Encourage each other. Grow together. And then love like Jesus loved the world. Amen. And that's what we're called to do. Numbers 12. And I'll try to wrap it up. If I can. <laughs> um, Numbers 12, 3. Check this out. It starts by saying, now Moses was very humbled. Right? That's, that's a powerful just alone right there. Because Moses was pulled out from the nation of Israel to lead God's people when they left Egypt. He was the head honcho. There was no one else in charge. It was one man. Jesus didn't go, okay, I'm going to survey the land. And I'm going to have a contest or an election as to see who was going to be the number one man in this, in this community. God chose them. He says, now Moses was very humbled. More humble than any other person on earth. So immediately the Lord called to Moses Aaron and Miriam and said go out of the tabernacle all of you so the three of them went, in, went, to the, went out of the tabernacle then the Lord descended in the pillar of a cloud and stood in the entrance of the tabernacle that's powerful if God speaks to you directly he's telling you I want you to go outside right now and you're like oh Lord what did I do <laughs> do you guys get that feeling sometimes when your parents tell you that or a friend well here's God telling these three and then he says, Aaron and Miriam, he called. And they stepped forward. Ooh, that, took a courage. That's took courage. that took courage. And the Lord said to them, now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, will reveal myself in visions. I will speak to them in dreams. But then he goes, what, in verse 7? But not with my servant Moses. Of all my house, he is the one I trust, and I speak to him what? Face to face. Man, when we place ourselves in the humble stage where we truly know what we're, what we're doing in this relationship to do it all for the glory of God, when we have this true, genuine obedience and trust and humble experience and unconditional relationship, says so that we could... We could, we could speak face to face with God. He could ascend. And, and when he talks to you face to face, man, it is powerful. That's a relationship. I gladly take the dreams. I'll gladly take the visions. Those are, those, that's powerful and I love that. But man, when you get to experience when God speaks to you directly, that's amazing. Amen. That's where you're saying, Lord. Man, continue to bless me. I want to hear more of you. I want to experience what, you, and that's what we talked about the scripture. I want to know you and experience your love, your passion, your joy. Who am I that you are just giving me this feeling inside that you love me unconditionally? And I know that. Amen. And that's what he was telling here in the nation of Israel. Man, there's many of them. If there was many prophets and, and teachers and scholars, but no one is like Moses. I speak to him directly, face to face. That's family. That's a true relationship. That's unity in the body of Christ. When we get to speak, that's why it's so important. And I know in today's technology, it's easier for us to pick up the phone and text your loved ones. Because sometimes you, you're busy. 
But when, when, when you get to meet some, when you get to be there in, in their presence and you're face to face, there's a, there's a difference in that relationship. Amen. We're, sometimes we get too conditioned to look down that we never look up. That when someone acknowledges us, we're shocked and we're like, going, whoa, that person talked to me. And sometimes we're forgetting that. We're forgetting that, that, that intensity, that feeling of talking with someone else face to face. That's kind of going away little by little. Where now everything is, it's, it's a lot easier. But man, I encourage you to build that relationship. I had a friend that posted a picture, and this is the funniest thing. And maybe it's in every, in every family, but in, in, the, in our Hispanic culture, it was the funniest thing. I never understood when my parents used to say, come over to the house. We haven't seen you in a while. We want to talk to you. And then we get there, in the first, and we turn around, and they're asleep in the couch. And then it's two hours later, we're about to leave, and they're going, why are you guys leaving? And I go, well, you're asleep. And, and now I get it. You know, so a friend posted a picture, the best relationship my husband ever had with his dad, and their ball, falling, their ball is asleep in the couch. But, it's, but I understand that as a parent, when my, when my kids come over, if it was just for a second, man, there's something different about it. I get excited. I might not spare, you know, talk to them for two hours straight, but it was knowing that they were just there. That just had the different feeling inside of me that says, man, I want more of that. That's where God is saying, I'm right here. I want, and I want you to seek this relationship because I'm here and I'm ready to start it. Amen. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, let's, let's close with prayer.